right. Cast, cast, cast. So many tabs. <laughs> Let me switch to the middle. Oh, and a pillar number eight. Are we ready? I think this is the last pillar and then something else, but ooh. Right? Because it's eight pillars. Whatever. I'm getting ahead of myself. Pillar number eight is inherent superiority versus inherent inferiority. I don't think they're ready for this one. The, Ho <laughs> the Hollywood still is from a 1930s movie. Oh, the Hollywood still. I, I, I already don't understand this first sentence, and I don't know if that's a sign of what's to come, but here we are. <laughs> it's from a 1930s movie released during the depth of the Jim Crow era. Immediately stop laughing. A black woman, ample in frame and plain of face, wears a headscarf and servant's uniform. Her arms are wrapped around a white woman, slender, cherubic, and childlike. Her golden hair and porcelain airbrush skin pops against the purposely unadorned darkness of the black woman. When they begin to speak, the dark woman will utter backward syllables of servility and ignorance. The porcelain woman will speak with the, matter, the mannered refinement of the upper caste. The fragile frame of Mary Pickford is in direct contrast to the heft of Louise Beavers in a set piece of caste played out in a thousand films and images in America, implanting into our minds the inherent superiority in beauty, deservedness, and intellect of one group over another. As it happens, the black actress Louise Beavers was nothing like the image she was given little option but to play. She grew up in California and had to learn and to master the broken dialect of Southern field hands and servants. She was frequently under stress in the narrow box she was confined to, which led her to lose weight on set. The filmmakers made her attach padding to her already full frame to ensure that she contrasted all the more with the wayfish white... Oh my gosh, these words, Isabel. That's W-A-I-F-I-S-H, wayfish, white, ingenues, ingenues who were the stars of whatever film she was in. Ingenues, that's ingenues, I knew that word, but it was just like right after. <sighs> Beneath each pillar of caste was the presumption and continual reminder of the inborn superiority of the dominant caste and the inherent inferiority of the subordinate. It was not enough that the, the designated groups be separated for reasons of pollution, quote unquote, or that they not intermarry or that the lowest people suffer due to some religious curse but it, that it must be understood in every interaction that one group was superior and inherently deserving of the best in a given society and that those who were deemed lowest were deserving of their plight. For the lowest caste person, his, unque quote, his unquestioned inferiority had to be established, wrote the anthropologists Audrey and Brian Snedley, and that alleged inferiority would become the, quote, basis for his allocation to permanent servile status, end quote. At every turn, the caste system drilled into the people under its spell, the deference due to those born into the, to the upper caste and the degradation befitting the subordinate caste. This requires signs and symbols and customs to elevate the upper caste and to demean those to the bottom in small and large ways, and in everyday encounters. Mm. Quote, he must be held subject like other domestic animals, observed the 19th century abolitionist William Goodell, quote, to the superior race holding dominion over him, end quote. African Americans during the century of the Jim Crow regime and Jews during the murderous 12 years of the Third Reich were often prohibited from sidewalks and were forced instead to give way to the dominant caste or to walk in the gutter as a reminder of their de degraded station. Quote, if a Negro, man or woman, met a white person on the street in Richmond, Virginia, for example, wrote the historian Bertram Doyle, they were, quote, required to give the wall, and if necessary, to get off the sidewalk into the street 
on pain of punishment with stripes on the bare back, end quote. Give the wall. Mm. During the height of the caste systems in America, in India, and in the Third Reich, the lowest caste was not permitted to bear the symbols of success and status reserved for the upper caste. They were not to be dressed better than the upper caste, not to drive better cars than the upper caste, not to have homes more extravagant than the upper caste should, should they manage to secure them. In India, the caste system dictated the length and folds of a Dalit woman's saris. Dalits were not to wear the clothing or jewelry of upper caste people, but rather tattered, rougher clothing as the, quote, marks of their inferiority, end quote. In America, the South Carolina Negro Code of 1735 went so far as to specify the fabrics enslaved black people were permitted to wear, forbidding any that might be seen as above their station. They were banned from wearing, banned from wearing, quote, any sort of garment or apparel whatsoever, finer, other, or of greater value than Negro cloth, duffels, Coarse curses, Osnabrigs, that's O S N A B R I G S, blue linen, check linen, or coarse garlics or calicos. That's garlics with an X. I guess the, these are the, uh, the cheapest, roughest fabrics available to the colony. 200 years later, the spirit of that law was still in force as African American soldiers were set upon and killed for wearing their army uniforms. Ooh. Ooh, ooh, that part. In Germany, one of the characteristics that enraged the Nazis was the wealth and success of German Jews and any public display of it. Late in the Second World War, a young Jewish woman in Berlin had on a fur coat when the Gestapo rounded her and others up and shoved them onto cattle cars to the concentration camps. Upon arrival, the SS were incensed to see a Jewish woman in fur that their wives could likely not afford, and, at a hatred, forced her into the camp's pigsty and rolled her in her fur coat over and over in the icy muck, leaving her to die in the bitter cold. But this was just days before the Allied forces reached them, and this was how she survived, eating the food scraps thrown into the sty. She huddled beside the pigs and stayed warm until liberation. From the beginning, the power of caste and the superior status of the dominant group was perhaps never clearer than when the person deemed superior was unquestionably not. <laughs> Sorry. Given that intelligence is distributed in relatively similar proportions among individuals in any subset, it was a special form of human abuse that everyone in a particular group, regardless of intellect, morality, ethics, or humaneness, was automatically accorded control over everyone in another group, regardless of their gifts. The historian Kenneth Stamp, this, I, the, that P hard because there's two P's. It's S-E-M-P-P, -P, so it's Stamp. Describe. <laughs> oh my God. Thank you, friend. So that guy describe the arbitrary nature for, of life for enslaved people in the caste system. Stop, I'm reading something so serious. ADHD is not good for reading really serious things and also thinking funny things at the same time. Okay, back to it. <sighs> so he uh, described the, ar okay, the arbitrary nature of life for enslaved people in the caste system. Oh, the arbitrariness, please. Okay, yes. The terrifying forced submission to individuals who are unfit for absolute power over the life and death of another. Quote, they were owned by a woman unable to read or write, Stamp wrote. Scarcely able to count to 10. Legally incompetent to contract marriage, end quote and yet had to submit to her sovereignty, depend upon her for their next breath. They were owned by, quote, drunkards such as 
Lyle Byrne Lewis of Livingston County, Kentucky, who once chopped a slave to bits with an ax. Sorry. Stamp wrote. And by sadists such as Madame Lowlery, La Lalari of New Orleans, who tortured her slaves for her own amusement, end quote. Mm. In order to survive, they were, they were to, quote, they were to give way to the most wretched white man, observed the Farmer's Register of 1834. For much of the time that African Americans have been in this land, they have had to find ways to stay alive in a structure that required total submission. A close reading of their betters and the performance of that submission in order to avoid savage punishment. Quote, they must obey at all times and under all circumstances, cheerful, cheerfully and with alacrity. A-L-A-C-R-I-T-Y. Said a Virginia slaveholder. They had to adjust themselves to the shifting and arbitrary demands of whatever dominant person they happened to be encountering in that moment. I underlined that heavily. That is so yes. This created a nerve jangling existence given that, quote, any number of acts, according to a North Carolina judge during the time of slavery, could be read as, quote, insolence. Whether it was, quote, a look, the pointing of a finger, a refusal or neglect to step out of the way when a white person is seen to approach, end quote. To these, the 19th century orator Frederick Douglass added the following gestures that could incite white rage and violence. Mm. Quote, in the tone of an answer, Douglas wrote, in answering at all, in not answering, in the expression of countenance, in the motion of the head, in the gait, manner, and bearing, quote, end quote. If any of these, quote, if tolerated, would destroy that subordination upon which our social system rests, the North Carolina judge said. This code extended for generations. Years after the Nazis were defeated across the Atlantic, African Americans were still being brutalized for the least appearance of stepping out of their place. Planters routinely whipped their sharecroppers for, quote, trivial offenses, wrote Allison Davis and Burley and Mary Gardner in 1941. A planter in Mississippi said that if his tenant, quote, didn't stop acting so big, the next time it would be the bullet or a rope. That is, the way to manage them is when they get too big, end quote. In 1948, in 1948, my dad was born, by the way. At this time, my dad was like five, eating solid foods. A black tenant farmer in Louis, in Louise. Mississippi was severely beaten by two whites, wrote the historian James C. Cobb, quote, because he asked for a receipt after paying his water bill. He asked for a receipt. The most trivial interaction had to be managed with ranking in mind. Well into the 1960s in the American South, the mere boarding of a public bus was a tightly choreographed affair devised for maximum humiliation and stigma to the lowest caste. Unlike dominant caste passengers who climbed aboard, paid their bus fare, and took a seat, black passengers had to climb up, pay their fare, then get off the bus so as not to pollute or disturb the white section by walking through it. Having been forced to disembark after paying, they had to they then had to run to the back door of the bus to board in the colored section. It was not uncommon for the bus to drive off before they could make it to the back door. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The passengers who had the least room for error, the least resources to lose the benefit of the ticket they had paid for, the least cushion to weather a setback, would now be humiliated as the bus pulled off without them, now likely to arrive late for work, thus putting already tenuous jobs at further risk. It was in the 60s. It was in the 60s. Quote, the Negro occupies a position of inferiority and, and servility, of which he is constantly reminded when traveling. Mm -hmm. We could have a whole 
I did a cross country in 2020. We could talk about that. I just want to see it like compared to like a white person doing it. It would be really interesting. <clears throat> by, uh, so he's constantly reminded when traveling by restricting, by restriction and by the attitudes of his white neighbors, wrote the historian Bertram Doyle. The laws and protocols kept them both apart and low. The greater the chasm, the easier to distance and degrade, the easier to justify any injustice or depravity. Keeping us apart and low. It's easier. That's why I said um, when I heard that proximity breeds care and distance breeds fear. It's real. And then the, the more you fear something, the more you're willing to enact violence on it. Quote, the human meaning of caste for those who live it is power and vulnerability, privilege and oppression, honor and de denigration, plenty and want, reward and deprivation, security and anxiety, wrote the preeminent American scholar of caste, Gerald Berman. Quote, a description of caste which fails to convey this is a travesty. Can I, I want to do those again. Hold on. Those were so good. Because they weren't, they weren't like opposites. I mean, they were. But like, it was kind of like the 1D, 3D conversation I tend to have. Um, power and vulnerability, privilege and oppression. It's like the one takes from the other or like requires the depletion of it. Something, oh my gosh, I just have to come back to this. Honor and denigration plenty and want that one reward and deprivation security and anxiety like the the when we're talking about pri like so like when you're, you're talking about racism is racism or <coughs> it's one to one no it's not why you could be racist to white people shut it it's not oh okay i love those all right, one more time. Um, in the slaveholding South, some in the dominant caste grew so accustomed to the embedded superiority built into their days and the brutality that it took to maintain it that they wondered how they might manage in the afterlife. Quote, is it possible that any of my slaves could go to heaven? A dominant caste white woman in South Carolina asked her minister, quote, and I must see them there? End quote. A century after the slaveholder spoke those words, the caste system had survived and mutated, its pillars intact. America was fighting <clears throat> in World War II, and the public school district in Columbus, Ohio, decided to hold an essay contest, challenging students to consider the question, quote, what to do with Hitler after the war? End quote. It was the spring of 1944, the same year that a black boy was forced to jump to his death in front of his stricken father over the Christmas card the boy had sent to a white girl at work. In that atmosphere, a 16-year-old African-American girl thought about what should befall Hitler. She won the student essay contest with a single sentence. Quote, put him in a black skin and let him live the rest of his life in America." End quote. And apparently when I read this the first time, I wrote, oh shit, <laughs> exclamation. And that is the end of the eight pillars of cast. Anyway, part four will be the tentacles of cast. Ooh, gosh. She just be wah, wah, wah. Hit me in the face. Oh. Oh.